Welcome back to the Suzuki main stage. Last but not least, we're really excited to be joined today by Dougal Henschel to help us celebrate the seven decades of the show by looking back to 1952 when the show began and looking at the dinghies that defined each decade. If you have any thoughts or questions, please type them into the box and we'll try to get through as many as we can at the end of the talk. Over to you, Dougal. Good afternoon, Hannah, and thanks for that introduction. So here we are, seven decades, seven dinghies. But if we're going to talk about these seven decades, the first thing we've got to do is, of course, we're going to have to go all the way back to those days in the 1950s. The UK was a very different place. It was a very grey place. We were still in austerity and the dinghies reflected that. Now, it's interesting that when we talk about the first ever dinghy show, people would still have been wearing masks, not because of COVID, but because this was the year of the great smogs, pollution heavy fogs that tended to last all day. Thankfully, the fog had cleared by the time you got down to the UK, to the seaside, where the whole issue of boats, dinghies, and boat building was accelerating fast. One of the papers ran a quiz about what did people, the working man, aspire to, and they aspired to being a boat owner. So it's little surprise that all the way back then at the College of Physical Education in London, we had the build your own dinghy exhibition and conference because building your own was very much the ethos at the time. Boat builders were few and far between. And of course, the boats they were building and the boats they had been building were very traditional. Clinker built, quite heavy. Certainly performance sailing had yet to take off. But if we were to have a dinghy show back then, what would it have been like? Well, many of the names we would have had are names we would recognise now. You've got the British Moth and the Cadet and the Evergreen Firefly, the Evergreen Fairy Firefly, the boat that would introduce us to smods. You had the National 18 and the International Canoe. And then, of course, you had the Finn, which was the new boat that was going to be at the Olympics that year. The GP14 and the strange little thing in the bottom right hand side is what passed for an International Moth back then. Now, of course, one of the things about dinghy shows is that it's all about talking with one another and catching up on the latest gossip. And the stories of the show would have been this. For the first time, the RYA managed a shotgun marriage between two classes. On the left hand side, you had the tall, stately river orientated Merlins. On the right hand side, the far more robust, better at sea rockets. And what the IYA, the RYA did was to bring these together to create that iconic Merlin rocket class. So that would have been one big talk, talking point. The other big talking point, I'm going to have to apologise for this picture because it's the only one, as far as I know, in existence, would have been this boat. This is JJ Lord's Wildfire which is the first boat designed for construction only in GRP. A good Trivial Pursuit question there. What's the first boat? But yes, it's the wildfire. Sadly, it wasn't around for long. But this was the boat that uh, started the ball rolling. But these are interesting boats, but they're hardly boats of the decade. So let's start looking at the boats that do have those qualities. First up, Jack Holt, seen here sailing his solo. Now, the solo is classic Holt, but it's also the first boat that was aimed to fill the domestic single handed market here in the UK. Now, we all know the problems of uh, having crews and the attractions of sailing single handed. I mean, at the time you had the, the Finn and the OK. But this was a boat that was so good for the UK domestic scene. Jack Holt at his very best. Now, in contrast to that lovely little solo, 
you've got the brilliance of Ian Proctor with his go anywhere, do anything while a wayfarer. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a, a sailing school looking to teach basic beginners to, into the arts of sailing, or if you want to sail across the, uh, the seas to Iceland where it's cold, or you wanted hot competition, the Wayfarer provided it all. And this would have been a very, very good claim for a boat of the, the decade. But we have to move on. Because the 50s were also the time when we saw the arrival of the big cats. Now, in contrast to catar catamarans today, they were still quite heavy. They had solid bridge decks and the rigs were still quite unsophisticated, as were many of the fittings. But nevertheless, these boats were still so quick that they forced the uh, revision of the PY system to accommodate them. So the sheer water is in the mix as well. But all these boats pale into significance against my boat of the 1950s. And of course, it's the 505. It's hard to overstate just how different the 505 was in contrast to the boats that were sailing at the time. If you look at the hull form, and compare it to what was around, this was a true game-changing boat. But it wasn't just a, a blasting machine for the open water. The 505 is still a very, very sophisticated performer, inland, light airs, on a lake. In fact, you can go pretty much anywhere in the world and the 505 will be very much the boat that everybody wants to sail. Now, it's interesting, of course, because the boats you're seeing here on the video are flying the big spinnaker. But even the, the first generation of spinnakers on the 505 were bigger in comparison with all the other boats of the time. John Westall, the designer, made sure that this was a boat that from the outset was going to be very much the leading top performer. OK, so now we're coming on into the 60s. Peace and love, uh, flared jeans, long hair. Yep, I had them all. Uh, but right. So we're into the 60s, the Beatles era. And we're going to start looking because this is the most difficult year, decade, should I say, the most difficult decade to choose a boat from because the choice was so great. And we're going to start with the 420. Here was a, a youth boat that burst onto the scene and it was a, another game changer. It was simple yet quick and absolutely amazing. But if you know, the 420 would change the way youth sailing would then feed on up into the adult classes. It was doing it then and it still does it now. And on top of all that, it was a massive amount of fun. We mustn't forget the multi hulls. And now we have the unicorn cap. Now, the unicorn went in for the IYU cat trials and it didn't win. It was let down quite badly by its rig. But once the rig was sorted out, for many years, the unicorn became the A class cat that was uh, out there holding, flying the flag for cat sailing single handed. It was light. This was where we saw what we call tortured ply construction, very much to the fore, had a trampoline bridge deck rather than a solid bridge deck. And it was quick and it was robust. This wasn't a fragile boat. Unicorns would be out there sailing in the windiest of conditions. And it's interesting that the very high tech A-class cats of the day owe their DNA to the unicorn. Ah, now we have another boat that came to us via the IYRU trials. And of course, it's the Contender. Now, we have to remember that in the 1960s, the performance boats in terms of single handers were the International Canoe and the Finn. And I'm sorry, the Finn, although a lovely boat, doesn't really match my criteria for what I'd call a performance boat. 
then came along the contender it was wide it was flat it was fast it was fun and one would have to say in my book this is the last of the really pretty boats that we took on as international classes now i'm sure this boat everybody would be thinking would be the boat of the decade the ubiquitous mirror you built it yourself you sailed it yourself and you had fun whether you were just pottering around with your family or whether you're out racing yeah the mirror did it all you could buy the kit for 67 pound and build it in the winter and go out and sail it schools clubs they built mirror by the thousand and it introduced so many people to sailing including ben ainsley but that build it yourself sail it yourself attitude applies to my boat of the decade which of course has to be the fireball and if there was a boat that caught the zeitgeist of the 1960s this is it we're now talking the swinging 60s where everything went from black and white into color people wanted to have fun and they wanted to go fast and have fun and the great thing about the fireball was that you got lots of girls crew you got lots of girls helming but it was a boat that was about having fun afloat having fun ashore and the great thing was you could build it yourself just like if you could build a mirror you could build one of these jack chippendale the boat builder took peter milne's design tweaked it a little bit so that you could easily build the boat around a, a cockpit rectangle and the rest as they say is history and on a breezy day on a with sunshine and waves as we can see in this picture there is no boat quite like it for going out and just having an amazing blast and having fun this truly is a boat for that decade of the 60s and i think you know, it will stay with us for many years to come so i'm just going to see a bit more i love this shot of them reaching because you just want to be out there with them right the 70s well what can we say about the 70s apart from the fact that this is most likely the peak of that golden deck that golden era of dinghy sailing where boats were being built in their thousand and everybody wanted to be out there you were getting turnouts of over 200 boats at a nationals and it was all about being out there being a part of what was going on so what were the boats of that decade well first up has to be another proctor boat and his wonderful little topper now this was a boat that was years ahead of its time in terms of construction it wasn't how the boat was originally going to be built originally this was going to be built in ply and then in glass fiber but it was when dunhills got involved and they started making it in polypropylene that the topper took off and today this is a classic again you can find young people having fun in anywhere in the world and this was a boat that proctor was particularly proud of because of the fun he saw it giving young people in contrast to that uh, to the topper we're going to have our first bethwaite boat and this is interesting because it's not a boat that got huge traction here in the uk but at the same time you can't take away from the fact that the taser is an amazing boat it's certainly not over canvassed but the rig is sophisticated which proves that you can do more with less and in terms of a racing platform and a quick boat no spinnaker yet this is just as quick round a course as many spinnaker boats and it's again a huge amount of fun in breeze i'm a great fan of the taser and i think this is a boat that somebody will uh, maybe say yes we should be out there sailing in one of these now the dart it's hard to imagine dark uh, catamaran sailing without the dart it's maybe one of the simplest boats out there 
yet the most effective, yet it delivers fun by the bucket load. And the great thing about it is here you've got access into performance cat sailing at a bargain basement price. And thousands of people have uh, taken the dart to their heart and are sailing them then and are still racing them around the world now. And if you wanted to think of a, a boat that defined the decade, you'd be hard pressed to get past the dart, except for one thing, this boat, the laser, of course. Now, the laser is a bit of a Marmite boat, and that's putting it bluntly. A lot of people don't like them. Uh, some people refer to them as knee wreckers. And in truth, they're far from the best boat. They're not even really the best beach boat. There are better boats out there. But it was the laser that developed the synergy where the sum is greater than all the parts put together. The simple rig and the fact that here was a boat that you could just jump into and go and have the same boat as everybody else. Now, if we're talking about the object of the exercise being close racing, then it doesn't get any better than the laser and the racing that the laser delivers. And it's no mistake that many of the best champions around the globe have cut their teeth and you know, won their first big races in the laser. And it's not just a boat that for, for, the, uh, for the men. Because with the radial rig on, the laser has revolutionized where lady sailing has gone. And you've got great names now who are coming through, through the laser radial. And it's still the boat to be. Yes, of course, it's flawed. And anybody who's jibed and caught the main sheet over the back of the transom or looked at that horrible little, little rudder cavitating when you try and bear away will think, yes, it is flawed. But at the same time, the laser is a magic boat and truly qualifies us the boat of the 70s, the boat of the decade. All right, we're up to the 1980s. Oh, dear. What can we say about the 80s? Big shoulder pads, bad music, um, hot summers, cold winters, a uh, lot. And we have to have uh, a bit of a diversion because this isn't a boat, it's a family of boats, the Magnum family of moths. They have to be in here because it is hard to imagine the future direction that Dinghy was sailing would take if you didn't have the Magnum moths, the magic of Mervyn Cook, the building of John Claridge, and then all those great enthusiasts who would uh, stick these boats made out of wafer thin ply, would spend half their time repairing them. And yet here was a genre of boat that moved the moth from being on a par with the National 12 on PY, maybe a little quicker than a Firefly, to suddenly a boat that was quicker on the water than a Fireball. So the Magnum moths have to be in there as a potential boat of the 80s. Now, this would be a very good choice. And of course, it's the laser, too. Many people mocked it. Yet more Bethweight magic, that wonderful, easily driven hull shape. Now, you can forgive the designer for the rig because obviously the builder had certain things about wanting to be able to get the mast into the container and a spinnaker pole that was like a piece of spaghetti. But. This was a boat that was fast and delivered fun and was, again, all about that youth coming from the youth, from the junior classes and up into an adult international boat. And at the same time, having wonderful fun because the laser, too, was as much about having fun on shore as it was out on the water. A great understated boat, but sadly not the boat of the decade because that's going to be yet another Bethweight boat. And of course, it's the B-14. 
Now, this was a boat that went through a number of different guises before any different setups. At one time, you were going to have one person out on the trapeze. But instead, they settled on the idea of two people hiking off the racks. And at the same time, you've got a brilliant boat offering blistering performance. And yet this is not an expensive boat to be a part of. And yet you've got top flight international competition. And if you wanted to get into the joys of asymmetric sailing and just being able to go very, very quickly with an easily driven hull without a huge amount of uh, complexity that you'd get in, say, the 14, then the B14 just has to be the boat. And it, it just mapped on to that whole thing of the era of the 1980s. Brilliant. Right, the 1990s. Teletubbies. Uh -oh. And uh, so much more Titanic. I'm not going to do the Titanic piece, but here we are. We're into the 90s. Um, what did I say about the 90s? Well, it's a world coming out of recession and going into a great period of change. And that change is reflected in the boats. Now, a lot of people will mock when they see a picture of the laser 5000 because they say, oh, it's the five tonner. And it's true, the Laser 5000 was a bit lardy when it, you came to put it on the scales. The famous comment was when they weighed this boat at the IYIU uh, performance skiff trials out in Garda, the comment was, how much? Yes, but it wasn't how the boat was designed. It was supposed to be a high tech, lightweight flyer. The fact that Laser made it heavy made it bulletproof. You could go out there and you could thrash it around on a breezy day. And if you wanted an introduction to the thrills of twin trapezing, it would be the asymmetric up, a huge rig, then the Laser 5000 delivered it. And most of the times it would get you home without breaking. But there's more. The Laser 5000 is also on that list because it really opened the door to all the televisual aspects that this offered. Suddenly, with high tech uh, and high profile sponsorship from Audi, you had Laser 5000 sailing on the box and everybody wanted to watch it. And yet another Bethweight boat or part of the Bethweight family, we should say. Now, the 29er, what can we say about that? In terms of youth boats, this has to be the most sophisticated. It's the fastest, maybe even the prettiest. And by a long chalk, it's the best. You know, this is a boat that has got so much to offer that sometimes you wish you were actually small and young again, just so that you could go out and have fun like this, because the 29er is a brilliant boat and under any other circumstances would easily be the boat of a decade. Yet that accolade goes to the first of the real smods that appeared in the 90s. Now, you have to remember what the state of play was when the RS 400 first came into being. We had just come out of a huge recession. Boat building costs were spiralling. And people were beginning to be turned off by the fact that they would buy into their boat and suddenly somebody else would do something and it would be uh, quite simply obsolete, particularly in the Merlins. The Merlins were just going through a big era of change and the change wasn't just financial. The change was also about in the cruise. In one season, winning weight in the Merlin went from 26 stone to 21 stone. Also, people found they were too big to sell the boat. Yet here was a boat that looked just like a Merlin and yet it carried weight. It went well under all sorts of circumstances. And if you had breeze and that big kite up, quasi the late, the uh, RS 400 is an absolute blast to sail. 
and it's a wonderful boat yet it goes just as well in the light stuff and it's still with us today the first of the rs boats and many would say the best and this really is a true boat for the decade and they were into the two and there's a picture of Brittany and the rugby twin towers and everything else smods dominate but we're just about to have more change that change comes with boats like the rs fever the fever all of a sudden again it's simple road hold construction and yet it's brilliant and youth took to this boat fantastic if you take the belief that the future of sailing was going to be in asymmetric racing then this is the boat you went to to learn your trade now there would be some that would say that the role of the asymmetric spinnaker on a single hander had been greatly overstated but it may be but that doesn't alter the fact that the phil morrison design exquisite devotee d1 has to be a boat that represents everything that is great about that first decade of the new millennium it was a boat that yes it's demanding to sail may not have pleased everybody in terms of aesthetics but it is such a fantastic boat this would be a boat in any decade but unfortunately it's going to lose out to yet another single hander and of course it's the foiling moth but not just any foiling moth it's the blade rider foiling moths for a while had been very much the uh, the remit of the uh, the enthusiastic amateurs who were spending lots of time fiddling with their boat and then going out and breaking it and coming back with the blade rider you could buy your moth and get performance straight out of the box and the people who were sailing it introduced us to everything that was good and maybe not so good about foiling but if you wanted to you know really be a force to reckon with in the international moth scene once foiling became fully established then it would be the blade rider that would break so many of the old rules and with it would become very much a boat of its era a boat of the decade oh we won't ask what happened there right and our final decade and we're into the 2010s uh i don't think there's much there that we need on these that picture we need to worry about but we had to be worried because the 2010s is all about organized sailing being in decline and the very little choice in terms of new boats for this you know the sailing just wasn't growing in the same way and the three boats we've got to look at for this decade are all single-handers first up is yet another devotee with their beautiful take on the dan holman punk dinghy it's lovely this is it just oozes class it's a lovely boat to sail it's beautifully made a lot of fun to sell great people to be sailing it and yes you know the d1 had you know with the spinnaker had so much to recommend it but it's the d0 that is selling in great numbers around the world now my next boat will be a surprise because this isn't a boat that has got the backing of the big class the big names behind it yet it's a boat where there has been a conscious effort taken to move away from the boat as a commodity item to restore it to individuality the boats are as different as the helms that sail it and at the same time it's all about engendering a strong sense of ownership of pride of ownership this is a boat you want to own you want to modify it to your own requirements and at the same time it's a wonderful boat to sail but the boat of the decade can only be the rs aero and you look at the pictures of this sailing in breeze that lightweight hull the magic of the joe richards design and you think wow now this is a boat very different again to the um to the h2 but this is a boat that is very much the commodity item you just buy the boat you unwrap it put it together 
and you sail it. But what a boat. It offers the competition. It offers the speed, the thrills. And I guess the comment that would be made is that this is so much the, the, the boat that the laser could have been, but sadly never quite made it. But 50 years later, we can now see just what a laser clone should be. And in fact, this is far more than just being a modern laser. This is a classic boat, a class act in its own right. So there we have it. Seven decades, seven brilliant boats. Each one its own way has moved the game forward. Had been in the terms of dinghy sailing. And they're all boats that are with us now and that people are still looking to sail. I wonder which one is your choice. But for now, I just want to thank yachtsandyachting.com and Sail World, the marine photographers everywhere who provide so many great pictures of these wonderful boats. And of course, everybody who's been online with me this afternoon and who's about to complain about my choice of seven dinghies. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fascinating look back over the decades. And it's great to see how sailing has progressed over those years. We have had a question in from Susie and she asks, out of all the boats reviewed in this talk, what is your personal favourite and why? Um, that's, that's difficult, Hannah, because my personal favourite is most likely different to what I think is the best boat, because my personal favourite would most likely be the H2 because this is a boat uh, it's a modern boat and it's such a beautiful boat to sail um it's it's like sailing a merlin rocket without the lump of a crew in the front and a jib to get in the way it's a fantastic boat so my personal favorite would be the h2 thank you <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm boxing clever there because i'm i'm hoping well because like i say it's not the best boat out of all those seven in fact, it's not uh, the best boat out of all those we've seen today, but it's my personal. And so I've answered the question. <laughs> there you go. It's great to hear what your, your personal favourite is after that great review of all of them. Question from Stuart. He asks, is the decline of symmetrical spinnaker boats something that we should be concerned about, along with the strengthening of the single-handed classes? Absolutely. Um Anybody who it's like all these people who say, ah, oh, the future's foiling. Um, it's not the future is sailing. And there are a lot of places where a symmetric spinner, uh, a, a conventional symmetric spinnaker is actually better than asymmetric. Um, you know, certainly if you sail in tide, small courses, courses that aren't just straight windward lured, a symmetric spinner can, can be better. The danger is, is that as we try and move away from fantastic boats for youth, like the Mirror and the Cadet, where you have to learn all the skills and just rely on sailing something like a Fever, which has got a lower skill set for the crew because you're not having to do things like jibe spinnakers and everything like that. Um, I think, yes, we are losing something. And in terms of the strengthening of the single handed classes, Yes, again, it, it, it's it's uh, the sport is set upon a path and single hand is saying it's all about convenience. You can just rock up and go. Um, yeah, I do worry that and the proof of the pudding, Hannah, is that in the last couple of decades, there wasn't a single um, new two man boat, the, the RS 400 back nearly 20 odd years ago was the last time we really got excited about a two-man boat. Now that, that is really, really interesting. Thank you so much, Dougal, for that fascinating talk. We've had loads of great comments and questions. I'm afraid we have run out of time. So thank you so much. And thank you to all of our speakers this weekend. I'm sad to say that we have now reached the end of the talks here on the Suzuki main stage. There is still a few minutes to pop to the halls and see if you can pick up any last minute bargains. We hope you've enjoyed the show as much as we have. And remember, you can log in for the next 30 days and catch up with any of the talks that you missed this weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. We wish you a very happy and safe return to the water. <laughs>